Welcome to another episode of the Your Longevity Blueprint Podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Bryce Applebaum, who's a pioneer in neuro neuro optometry, passionate about unlocking life's potential through vision. His expertise includes reorganizing the visual brain post-concussion to return to learn and return to life, remediating visual developmental delays interfering with reading and learning, and enhancing visual skills to elevate sports performance. Dr. Applebaum has been featured on the front page of USA Today in the New York Times Magazine, Bethesda Magazine, and as the cover story of OT Advanced. Dr. Applebaum has worked with hundreds of professional athletes, numerous professional and collegiate sports teams, and countless amateur athletes to transform raw talent into honed performance through vision. He also helps teams consider who to draft or sign as free agents based on assessing a player's visual potential and identifying how far off they may be from operating at that ceiling. He's the owner and managing doctor at Applebaum Vision PC, a private practice specializing in vision therapy and rehabilitation with offices in Bethesda and Annapolis, Maryland. Dr. Applebaum is a board certified fellow of the College of Optometrists in Vision Development and an adjunct clinical professor at the Southern College of Optometry. Dr. Applebaum is on mission to change the way the world views vision. He believes there's more to vision than to just 2020 eyesight and has developed programs to retrain the brain to revise the eyes. He's here with us today to discuss the misdiagnosis and missed opportunities of vision, why healthcare has it all wrong about the eyes. Welcome to the show, Dr. Applebaum. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Gray. Pleasure to be here. That was quite the bio, kind of hard on my eyes. Just kidding. <laughs> I wanted to give you a workout to begin with. So. <laughs> so I do want to echo what I read in your bio. I want listeners to know why healthcare has it all wrong about the eyes. But first, what got you so interested in this unique specialty? Great question. So um, when I was a child, I had very substantial visual developmental delays um, that contributed to a really high, abnormally high prescription at an early age. I had reduced eyesight. I had depth perception problems. I had sensory integration challenges, motor mm-hmm. delays. Uh, a lot. Ca- <laughs> a lot. Couldn't catch a ball. I was a mess. And uh, luckily, my father was a an eye doctor, and he was getting into this field and uh, basically created this specialty for me where I attribute all of my success in life athletically, academically, a lot of even what I've learned interpersonally to what I learned with vision therapy. And obviously we'll talk about what's involved there, but I I deeply know what it feels like to struggle with reading and learning, with um, feeling different, you know, not being cast out by mm. your peers and, and even more so how unbelievably life-changing it can be to turn a weakness into a strength. And yeah. so now I'm very passionate about helping people and not letting them be on the path I was on. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, good, good thing. Right. <laughs> good thing your dad was an eye doctor. For um, sure. so I, I love hearing and a progressive one at that because that was years ago, right? Absolutely. Sounds like. So let's dive into what vision therapy is. So I'm assuming that's what you use to help you, right? So what, what is Absolutely. vision therapy, and why have so, so many people not heard of this yet? Great question. So vision therapy is essentially physical therapy for the brain through the eyes. So it's rewiring the software in the brain to change how somebody uses their visual system. So many people have not heard about this. And that's, that is a, the mission I'm on is to raise awareness because Mm -hmm. uh, we are all taught in school how to look at eyesight and eye health and how to intervene when there's disease and how to deal with structure, but so little on function. And you have to do a separate residency and fellowship and all of that. And there's just very few people in, in this space um, you don't have to be board certified to offer vision therapy, but I would ar- argue the level of of care is dramatically different when mm-hmm. you are. And so that's mm-hmm. just a, a process that's elective, but it helps you really know what you know and what you don't know and mm-hmm. to learn what you don't know. Like, so how rare is this? Because we were talking before we started recording, there might be just one person near us that has even some of this minimal training, but like how how rare are we talking like few eye doctors per state or like how- so def- definitely yeah. a handful per state um yeah. depending on the state as well um in, in i'm in in uh, maryland right outside washington dc mm-hmm. and in dc and maryland there are eight doctors board certified out of like six or seven thousand wow. and those eight comprise five different practices so wow. there's a lot more people doing vision therapy i know a lot of physical therapists have adopted some of these sure. techniques a lot of ot's a lot of speech therapists just based off of the awareness do chiropractors too? I mean, do, are there some? Yes, yeah, some yeah. do. Um, some chiropractors will actually have somebody uh, come in wearing their glasses and do manipulations and look at different balancing uh, procedures through the lenses to see, like, is this prescription right? Is it off? And and I, that's a little bit sure. out there, but 
Um, work on vision and the visual brain can be considered vision therapy, I guess, depending on the lens you're seeing mm -hmm. it through. Mm. I've already decided I needed it, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> so, <laughs> but let's talk about nearsightedness. So I think that's increasing at an alarming rate with children. And so part of me wants to think, is that from screens and are screens bad for our eyes? Let's, can we go there? Talk nearsightedness and, you know, danger of screens. So all visual skills are learned skills. And when every child is born, we don't know how to track or focus or converge or uh, use our eyes. And it's something that through our life experiences, we develop the ability to use our eyes together. So that's something that's either learned well or not learned as well as it could be. And that's when some intervention is needed more so than ever. And I, I know you have a young child. Mm -hmm. Kids are being introduced to technology at earlier and earlier ages than ever. Uh, kids are reading in kindergarten when most are not visually ready for reading in kindergarten. And to really simplify it, if we're presented with stress from our environment, we don't have the tools in place to meet those demands, we either adapt or we avoid. Mm. Nearsightedness has two main components, genetics and environment. Can't do much about genetics, can't control mm -hmm. your parents are. Uh, but environment wise, you know, if you're presented with these challenges and you don't have uh, the vision development to support that, and we usually adapt, and usually that occurs with near issues. So then far away blur becomes the symptom of the near problem. And our profession treats the symptom and says, well, you can't see the letters on the letter chart. Here are some glasses. And absolutely, that makes far away clear. But then very mm -hmm. often, that becomes your new normal. You adapt to that. You need something stronger for the same clarity. And then you're on this cycle where you're in glasses for the rest of your life that are always changing. Yikes. So screens... Are you saying screens are actually more bad at a younger age then? A thousand like, percent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, screens are more bad at a younger age. Um, more bad. <laughs> there, there, are Worse, guide, yeah. there are guidelines yeah. from um, American Academy of Pediatrics that say no child under, I think it just says no child should be on a screen for more than two hours. Um, I usually mm -hmm. say like if you're under 18 months, uh, limit screen time to just engaging never, with or, yeah. ever. But FaceTime with some a loved one, especially over COVID where you're not seeing somebody, but that's sure. it. Sure. And then as you get older, you know, that should go up to like 30 minutes if you're under two, maybe an hour if you're under five, and then really everything in moderation. Sure. You know, taking as many breaks as you can. So obviously an iPad in front of your face is, I would think, worse than, you know, TV across the room. So is distance very important? I think you had a social media post about this. Maybe with your kid, having them scooch back. <laughs> uh, you know your yeah. stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so rule of thumb, larger the screen, the farther away, the better. Okay. So it gives, you, it gives all your listeners an excuse to go buy the biggest TV they can find and put it as far away as they can. Because what happens when it's up close is you, it's a significantly different demand on the visual system. So the outside muscles have to converge the eyes. The inside muscles have to focus the eyes. And that synergy between those two systems is really the root cause of most functional visual developmental delays and, and the problems that occur. Okay, very interesting. I want to go back to genetics because you said one component of nearsightedness is genetics because my eye doctor always says that, but I kind of feel like we always just blame everything on genetics. So that's true, but the variable we can change is this the environment. Like you're saying, distance is on your side. Just Absolutely. So Genetics wise, based off of the alarming increase in nearsightedness that is uh, dramatically increased, I think there's an estimation that by 2050, about half of the population will be nearsighted. So yeah. if both parents are nearsighted, the child has a one in two chance of becoming nearsighted. Okay. If one parent is, it's one in three. And if zero parents are, I think it's one in four. And that's just our environment. This wasn't an issue mm -hmm. 50 years ago you know, before there were all these tablets and phones. And sure. obviously there's a time and a place for tablets mm -hmm. for young kids, but I'm sure you've seen many parents who use this, use a screen as a babysitter. And then, you know, mm -hmm. the, they're stuck at that distance forever. And uh, I never thought I would be that parent, but there have been times where I'm like, just watch the, well, we know. all, we yeah, all yeah, are there. Yeah, right? yep, yep. But I think a, a good way to, to think about it is like, if you were to squeeze your hand as hard as you can, you can do it for maybe five, 10 seconds and your hand's going to start to, to kind of get sore and get tired. Mm -hmm. But if you were to do this open and close, you could do it for a very long time and still maintain that, that stamina. 
our muscles that control focus in our eyes are sphincter. They're circular. So when you look close, the muscle constricts. When you mm-hmm. look far, it relaxes. Mm-hmm. You're stuck on a screen. You're stuck with it constricted. And there's not a whole lot you can do without looking away and taking breaks and, mm-hmm. you know, balancing that type of, um, of setup. Yeah, sure. Makes sense. What about ADD, ADHD? So could those behaviors be due to hidden vision problems? So uh, we have a 30 question predictive checklist of the most common symptoms associated with treatable visual developmental delays. More than half of those symptoms are the exact same symptoms on the DSM-4 classification for ADD or ADHD. Most diagnoses of attention problems are based off of behavior and observation and sometimes testing, but there's not really Mm -hmm. a way to measure a biochemical balance in the brain to know whether somebody needs more of a certain neurotransmitter or doesn't. From a vision standpoint, there's two particular diagnoses, but the most common one is something called convergence insufficiency. Explain that. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. So convergence insufficiency (laughs) means uh, by the language, you think it means that somebody can't cross their eyes. But essentially what it is, is Hmm. a spatial mismatch in that the outside muscles are not coordinating well to keep both eyes pointing and focused on a near target. So a simple way to test this is take a an expensive piece of equipment, take a pen or pencil, have have your child or yourself look at that, and you're going to bring it close along your midline all the way up to your nose until you can't make it single or clear anymore. It should be pretty effortless to our nose, but for so many kids, that near point of convergence is reduced, and so they say they can't make it one. There becomes this competition mm. between which eye looks at it, and then they look away, or you see an eye drift. Convergence insufficiency is so unbelievably common in kids. As, as some studies say, as high as 20% of kids have mm. this. Um, but if you're diagnosed with that, you're way more likely to be mislabeled as having a problem with attention because think about a child in a classroom setting or being asked to read or write. You're having to converge your eyes to be up yeah. close. This only happens in ear. And if you can't maintain the stamina or keep your eyes pointing and focus at that place, the words move, you lose your place, you have to look away and disengage. And, and so often yeah. kids in the classroom are not paying attention, or it seems like that, but they're really relying on auditory rather than vision because vision's not providing them the feedback that, that they want or deserve. Mm. So, so before think, you, yeah, before you medicate your children, yeah, listen to the episode where we talk about diet, <laughs> reducing inflammatory foods, and also get vision checked, but not, I don't even say get your vision checked because parents are getting their children's vision checked. So here, right? here's a so, great way to look at it. Think of eyesight and vision as separate entities. Eyesight's how well we see. That's letters on a, a letter chart in an eye exam, a street sign when you're driving, the, the board in the classroom. Vision is entirely brain and how the brain okay. tells the eyes what to do and how we drive meaning direct action. I like that. So even just asking a doc, any eye doctor should know how to test for convergence insufficiency. Okay. So you can ask for that then. Yep. You can ask for that. They may not, I think the, what it means, what it implies and the treatment is going to be all over the place. Um, but there's lots of great resources online that give tons of information on convergence insufficiency and treatable vision problems. Uh, one great one is visionhelp.com, V-I-S-I-O-N-H-E-L-P. It's a complete advocacy group I'm a part of with the goal of just raising awareness Sure. And there's videos, uh, research, a lot on there on convergence insufficiency and a ton of other stuff as well. Oh, for the listeners, I'll post that link in the show notes too. Great information. Okay, what about dyslexia? So along similar lines, um, dyslexia by definition means difficulty reading words. I'm biased, of course, but I would say 95% of people I work with have difficulty reading words, but because of a vision problem that was hidden previously. So often tracking our eyes and keeping them pointing on the word across the page and focusing our eyes and making the words clear and converging our eyes to see a single clear image. Um, If those are not operating or or functioning where they should, it's going to be a lot harder to read those words, to decode, to then comprehend that information, to think about that information. And so uh, very often, kind of like ADD or ADHD, dyslexia is a diagnosis that describes behavior. There's more testing that's standardized to kind of assign that label, but it's it's very often the visual centers and language centers are not communicating with each other. And there's lots of different treatments out there that can help improve reading. 
um, especially for those with that label of dyslexia, because oftentimes it's not accurate. And, and uh, when it is accurate and there's problems with phonological awareness and kind of getting the sounds with the letters and the words and being able to filter all that and make sense of it, um, you know, th that's something that uh, can be improved with the right type of learning to take place. Good to hear. Okay. What would you say some of your misperceptions, well, not your misperceptions, what are some of probably the listener's misperceptions about vision? I could go in so many directions here. So um, I would say one of the biggest is your prescription shouldn't really change every year. And that's kind of a... Yeah an explosion in, in many people's minds, you know, if we're adapting to the lens we're in and we're needing something stronger to maintain the same clarity, we're kind of going down a path. But if we think about a functional root cause of that is maybe the focusing system can't hold focus and can't mm -hmm. sustain it, or there's not flexibility there, or we're on screens too much, or, you know, we're not able to meet the demands of life. You treat the symptom, it gets far away has to get clear with a stronger lens but mm -hmm. if you treat the problem the underlying functional coordination problem then the symptom goes away which so, makes me so angry because i feel like that was me year after year after year granted i was obviously on my computer or in books studying right so through my you know early 20s and even into my 30s and yeah. my doctor kept saying oh your your vision will normalize it'll 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 quit declining because I, I was thinking at that time i wanted to get lasik eye surgery and every year i'd go back and i and i kept thinking well certainly this is you know, this deterioration is going to, is going to level off and I can eventually qualify for Lasix and my vision just kept getting worse and it kept wanting to up my prescription. And I finally said, no, I don't want it up anymore. I feel like, because <laughs> I had someone in one of my classes who was from another country and she said, no, no, when we go to see our eye doctor, like we want, we ask for less power, not more power. Cause we want to, you know, work our eyes and not just be kind of dependent on that. But I, I feel like I got robbed. I feel like I kind of got yeah, screwed well, because- so much of the world is robbed, you know, yeah. we're, um, we're all taught to have everybody see the smallest letters, crystal clear HD all day long. Not everybody has to see the same. You have to have vision, not interfere and be able to see clear enough to be successful in life. But right. um, I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and I think th there's a joke in our profession that it's rare to find a an attorney or a doctor or somebody who's been through a lot of reading and studying and schooling who doesn't have a prescription. Mm -hmm. I mean, we adapt to near, if, if we adapt to everything in life, we either avoid or adapt. So if we're adapting, the more near there is, the more near visual demands, the more likely that, you know, far away is going to be compromised. Mm. Evolutionarily, yeah. we're meant to be scanning the horizon and yes. looking for things in the distance. We're now making these scanning eye movements on screens with really small font and graphics all day long in many cases. And, you know, these problems were much rarer many, many years ago. Okay. So that's one misperception. Got a few more. Yes. Um, I, I would say that one of the, bi one of the big ones that I get asked about all the time is uh, the right drops for our eyes. Yes. Uh, and yes. I want to, if, if we, your listeners can leave with one take home, well, two take homes. One's going to be that vision therapy can change your life. Number two, uh, don't use Visine. And mm -hmm. Visine is a eye drop that constricts the blood vessels so that the eyes don't appear as red. But the second the drug wears off, there's a rebound effect that's twice mm -hmm. as high and mm -hmm. they're red for a reason. The red blood vessels are red to bring in more oxygen because of some underlying cause. And if you figure out, you know, I mean, there's plenty of drops that are great, like artificial tears that are non-preservative or um, you know, there's supplements you can take that can help with that. But I think in, in most cases, the, the red, the redness is because of some sort of dryness or irritation or virus or bacteria. Visine makes it worse. So please don't, please don't use that. You have a good video on that on your Instagram as well, which that, that caught my eye. Ha ha. But I, <laughs> nice. <laughs> but I uh, previously had Claudia, you know, Claudia on the show, her episode hasn't aired yet, but it'll likely air before yours will actually. And we talked a little bit about just dry eyes in general. And she yeah. does recommend resting your eyes, right? And cupping your eyes and like blinking to help with, with dry whatnot. But one of my questions I had for her, which is the same question for you, of course, is what are the you know best eye drops? You're saying non-preservative. Definitely so the, non the single use, like the single use, I, I do use those because I have pretty bad dry eyes, unfortunately. Um, 
but I think those are housed in plastic. And because I have a hormone clinic, right, and I'm so worried about endocrine disrupting chemicals, I can't help but wonder, you know, if those eye drops get shipped from Amazon, they're in my mailbox sitting in 100 degrees in Iowa weather, is that plastic leaching into the, you know, I and, don't know. I, I, and to be honest, we don't really no, know. There's not yeah. enough has been done there, but I can give you a solution that avoids all of that. One, one uh, hack for your health, omega-3 fatty acids which are, I take, you know, thank you. Yes. Yes. They're amazing. But from the tear film standpoint, there's three layers to our tear film. The outer layer is a layer called the mucin layer. Omega three is in the right consistency and the right quality. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least I usually recommend a thousand milligrams twice a day produces that layer of the tear film in a more viscous, thicker fashion. So your tears don't evaporate as quickly. Right. There's a protective barrier and it's rare for somebody with mild dryness who takes omega-3 fatty acids to not see a huge improvement in terms of symptoms. And then you're avoiding plastic and bottles. If, if it's good sourced uh, fish omega oil and, yes. and in the right place. Absolutely. And I do notice my husband, you know, I complain about my dry eyes. And then he says, well, how much fish oil are you taking? Cause I do notice when I take two grams versus one gram, I do notice yeah. a difference because I've, I've taken one gram my like almost my entire life, even as a kid. Like, <laughs> but what when, when I jump it up, I do notice a difference. I feel like with the the two grams. But and let me. Oh, can I ahead. just add one quick thing? So yeah. I would say ideally for the first two weeks, take one gram at separate intervals. So one in the morning, one at night. Divided. It, divide it. it you'll be able to absorb it more easily. Yep. Yep. I thank you. I would agree with that. So Claudia had recommended the um. I think they're from Switzerland, Similisan or something like that. Have you heard mm -hmm. of those more homeopathic? I have. Um, what, what do you think? What are your thoughts? I did order them. I haven't used them yet, but. <laughs> I would say um, they can be very helpful. There, there's, uh, they're a little more natural and holistic. And, and yeah, I think there's, yeah. uh, there's some really good drops like Sistain or Soothe or That's Refresh. What I, yep. Yep. That are, I would say, equally as good and in many cases more effective. Sure. Um, but, you know, as long as there's no preservatives and as long as you're trusting what's in there, then um, that's great. I think drinking a ton of water can be helpful, mm -hmm. um, you know, but but I think in general, that, that's a, a fine one, but it, it's, uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, any other misperceptions? Yes. Um, misperceptions about eye problems being brain problems. All eye problems are brain problems for the most part. So okay. any problem with tracking or focusing or converging or eye teaming or depth perception are all problems that initiate in the brain and can be treated through the brain. And if you're addressing it on the eye basis, it makes it much harder to be able to uh, see any changes in terms of the problems that are occurring. Um, there's neuroplasticity at every age. Let's talk uh, about that. Define neuroplasticity. Let's go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So neuroplasticity is our, our brain's ability to learn new things and to create new synaptic connections or new wiring that supports what is being learned. Any brain at any age can be taught new tricks. One of the biggest misperceptions in uh, the vision world from doctors is that most are taught in school. And I was taught in school and I graduated to school in 2009 that there's a critical period for vision development and that after age eight, you blow out the candles and then all of a sudden the visual centers of the brain can no longer be taught and what you see is what you get and you're stuck with where everything is. As silly as that sounds, um, that's still preached by the majority of ophthalmology and a lot of doctors, again, who are trained on intervention of eye disease and on structure. Um, not on and not on function. I, I currently have a 98 year old, 92 year old, and 89 year old all in vision therapy, developing depth perception for the first time. Wow. Um, I will say, as we get older, malleability decreases, and there's you know, as you can attest to, when you know infants, kids, ha our brains are like sponges, and you can learn things so much more easily. But with the right arrangement of conditions and the right um, situation where you're you're appropriately being taught from the right sequence of learning and from the right foundation, uh, any brain at any age can be retaught. Deaf perception can be developed at any age as long as there's two eyes um, and you know we can tap into that, to that wiring. Very encouraging. 
Okay. Any other misperceptions or did we cover? How, how long do we have here? I mean, I I've, got, I've got a bunch. Um, I think th there's a lot about um, patching and about. Let's, let's go there. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, there, so let's first kind of clarify two different terms that often get confused. Strabismus and amblyopia. Strabismus okay. is an eye turn. Amblyopia is a lazy eye. Both of these have huge misperceptions. So start with strabismus, which is an eye turn. Most eye turns are brain problems manifesting through the eyes, meaning there's no concern with eye muscle strength or length. It's the same with all of the six eye muscles that, that surround each eye externally. It's more coordination. So if we can go, go back to what we talked about earlier about uh, vision is learned, a child who skips over crawling or who walks too early and doesn't have the bilateral integration and the motor foundation to support the vision learning that comes and all of a sudden everything's static and then they start moving and are unstable and then their eye, eye teaming, their visual system is all unstable. Very often an eye term stems from walking before we're ready to be walking. Fast forward then to later in life, later mm -hmm. in life eye turns are developed if we're talking about the convergence and sufficiency, which is fragile eye teaming at near, if we're then because of a rivalry or competition over sensory input, meaning the brain can't understand how to filter both eyes at the same time, it picks one that ignores the other and throws it in or out or up or down so that it doesn't have to be involved with uh, vision learning. Most eye turns are treated from a medical community standpoint with eye muscle surgery. Oh, okay. I was thinking that's where I was thinking the patch was coming in, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, so with eye muscle surgery, um, it's very, very rare to have a functional cure. Best case scenario is a cosmetic cure, meaning the eyes look like they're straight, but for them to act like they're straight and for them to act like they're working together, the, the visual centers of the brain we we're talking about need to then learn how to use eye, both eyes together and filter and process the input at the same time to develop 3D vision or depth perception. Amblyopia, which is the lazy eye, meaning one eye not seeing as well as the other, um, stems from from three different one of three different things. Either the prescription's really high or different in one eye, and the brain, rather than using both, says, "I want to use the eye that's easier to, to see clearly with. I'm going to just ignore the other." It happens from an eye turn, meaning if one eye is out and the other eye is straight. Vision learning, vision development doesn't happen with that outside eye. And so the brain just learns how to see with the eye that's straight and the other eye gets ignored. Or it happens if there's some sort of structural problem early on, like somebody's born with a, a cataract in their eye or, or you know has, for whatever reason, some sort of blockage from that brain using that eye. Then amblyopia, which is the ability to see the small letters, uh, the inability to see the small letters, that's what, that's what comes out. Old school treatment is is patching. So to look at it as a good eye and a bad eye. So mm -hmm. let's cover up the good eye so the bad eye has to work. We now have the research to support what my profession has known forever in that amblyopia is a two-eyed problem just showing up on one side. And unless it's addressed on a two-eyed basis, it doesn't really get, get better. So a lot of kids who go through patching, you know, not even to considering the uh, the emotional toll that takes walking around with a patch on and feeling different from their peers and not being able to see out of that eye. But from a functional standpoint, you know, it's um, teaching the good, the bad eye to be, to engage in the presence of the good eye. And so the advanced treatments are literally learning how to pick out that eye's input when the other eye is there. So that's done with virtual reality or augmented hmm. reality or different filters or lenses or prism, all the tools that we have uh, with optometric vision therapy to be able to equalize the skills with each eye. So when both eyes are open, neither one takes over because there's not a difference between each eye's information. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, super interesting. But now I want to go off on a tangent, another tangent about eye patching because my, <laughs> my brother had a retinal detachment in his mid thirties. Mm -hmm. And you know, and he, I feel, I feel bad because he told me I'm losing my vision. And I said, go to the eye doctor, but I should have mm -hmm. said, go now, not wait. Well, and when, oh, good. <laughs> um, so I kind of feel bad. Like I, I could have pressured him to go earlier. He's very lucky he didn't lose vision in the eye. I mean, they said he yeah. was one in a, I don't know, hundred thousand. I mean, he's a, it was a very rare case because he had no other risk factors. It was no trauma, nothing, mm -hmm. but basically he had surgery and then he wore a patch for almost a year. 
And I think he was disserviced and I, I, cause I'm hearing about things like vision therapy right now. And I'm just wondering what he maybe wasn't offered that he should have been, but he finally got the patch off and the eye is, I mean, his vision is so it's terrible in that eye. Yeah. And I, I will yeah. correct something I did say. If the discrepancy okay. is, is very, very large between each eye, meaning like one, like, I can see the small letters. The other one can't even tell where the lights are on yep, yep. or just the big E then patching can't can be effective, but really active learning with the patch on is what's needed. Sure. It's not just, it's not just go through life covering that eye. It's more, right. let's do like discriminatory tasks. So, mm -hmm. you know, picking up straws, cutting up in little pieces and taking a, a stick and scooping them up or for a child stringing fruit loops or Cheerios on a string, this kind of visually guided motor mm -hmm. control work then allows the brain to put together the input from the tactile senses and the auditory senses with the visual senses to be able to then understand more effectively where that is and how mm -hmm. to engage with it. Hmm. Yeah, I think he needs to see you, but okay, so let's... <laughs> Happy so, to. Yeah. <laughs> so let's transition to sports for a minute. So in yes. your bio, obviously you work with a lot of athletes, which is super just fascinating. Um, so I, I do want to get to concussion and, and injuries, sports injuries, but first let's talk about how vision impacts sports performance. Absolutely. So if you can think about at an early age and you're probably doing this with, with your son, you, you're saying, all right, you got to keep your eye on the ball. And you're always taught that, but we're never really taught how to do that. Right. So from a sports performance standpoint, you know, the things that matter in sports are obviously seeing the ball and knowing where the ball is, but most importantly, being able to anticipate where the ball will be. So having really good depth perception that's dynamic, understanding your sense of self in space accurately, um, being able to use peripheral vision with central vision at the same time. Um, a lot of athletes always talk about being in the zone. When you're in the zone, that's this kind of locked in heightened state of, of visual arousal where it's almost like you are in this tunnel vision and nothing else around you is going on because you're so locked in. We can actually teach that and teach somebody yeah. to be able to slip into that place where they are so heightened peripherally that they can lock in and localize centrally really, really well. So I work with a lot of teams and players at the professional level and at the high level where it's small incremental changes in lots of different areas leads to a large cumulative effect in terms of performance. Sure. But especially, you know, a child or somebody who's a weekend warrior trying to compete with, with other dads or moms or other, other peers, um, you know, from a vision standpoint, the, re the small ball sports, vision matters that much more. So baseball, softball, basketball, tennis. Um, I also, I think vision development and cognitive development and how well they coincide matters a ton. And for somebody to have athletic talent, that's just God given and natural. You can't really train that, but to be able to allow somebody to maximize what they yes. do have and use, utilize it for longer. I mean, you can teach somebody how to see the court or the field from other perspectives or how to learn a playbook more efficiently or have visual memory that supports rapid changes that they can then filter and process like a movie rather than a flip book let's say so doing being uh, first identifying the areas of opportunity for learning is important mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. knowing how to close those gaps and to clean things up so that uh take the talent you already have but elevating it by achieving at the potential based off of using vision as that dominant sensory system that's guiding and leading rather than one that's just kind of there so you have a screening or assessment that you put your athletes through and then obviously you find their weaknesses and uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I do, mean, it is simplistic. Most thorough evaluation is about three hours long. Um, wow. And it's looking at lots of different areas. We have a, a much shorter one that we'll do for, um, you know, more as like a screening tool, but uh, we work with, with lots of teams, lots of players in, in unique sports, like a lot of, uh, people with race car driving and with archery mm -hmm. and riflery and fencing. I mean, sport vision, I'm biased, of course, vision matters. And it matters, mm -hmm. matters in all mm -hmm. sports, but certain sports, it matters a lot more than, than others. So um, there are specialists who do sports vision evaluations. There's a few doctors who that's all they do. Um, mm -hmm. But especially people in the vision therapy world, um, 
at least have a, an understanding of how to elevate performance and many, you know, that's a little bit more of a niche than anything else, but even less so than, than those who do vision therapy, there's not so many sports vision eye doctors out there. Serious question. Can I elevate the sports performance in a three and a half year old by improving uh, his vision? <laughs> how does he uh, get it? <laughs> So knowing that vision is on a continuum and, yeah, you know, yeah. there's certain skills that are considered normal for a three and a half year old. Uh -huh. I mean, there's, we have put a lot of young kids who are on home programs where we are literally advancing vision development so that, you know, because there's a problem, but also just to help it become you yeah. know, th that much more efficient. So depends on what sport you're trying to teach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, baseball, absolutely baseball, but no, I, <laughs> I mean, honestly, you talk to my husband, yeah. Playing but, catch, being at yeah. different distances, different size balls. Yeah. I mean, that you, you drill that hard early on. Not that I'm suggesting we do that because yeah. then you can, you can uh, burn them out. But I mean, that that's something that there, there's a reason why repetition and practice really does. Absolutely. Matter. Absolutely. You got me thinking, you know, when you see the little, even like the two and a half year olds who try to hit the ball off the tee and they're obviously not always hitting the ball, or hitting the tee. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. that could be a coordination thing, but is it just their vision is still developing? Well, you, and like, is that part of how hard it is? Like with your body rotating to be able to hold fixation on something as your all your gross motor muscles are moving or as you're trying yeah. to rotate or turn. I mean, when you see a, a two and a half, three year old, who's like, hitting a golf ball or hitting off the tee and and there's a reason these go viral it's not normal incredible yeah right? <laughs> yeah yeah totally <laughs> fun fun okay let's let's talk more i don't want to say doom and gloom because there's something we can do about this but let's talk about sports related related injuries so what is yes. a concussion and how is vision impacted with con concussions great question so this is becoming uh a huge, huge topic in my specialty. And, and actually my private practice now is over 50% concussion and brain injury rehab. Wow. And it's only increasing every year. So a concussion is any type of kind of insult or trauma to the brain. A lot of people think it has to be from this massive blow or hit, but we now know that even the most sudden little acceleration or deceleration of the brainstem, like a whiplash, can be considered a concussion because the damage that occurs neuronally to the brain is at such a small microcellular level that it impacts function um, and, and, and structure in many cases as well. Vision is represented in every lobe of the brain. There's more areas of the brain dedicated to processing vision than every other sense combined. So it's almost impossible to have a head injury, in my opinion, not have vision be impacted. It's just a matter of at what level is it? And the most common symptoms with head injury very often are related to vision. You know, fatigue, mm -hmm. eye strain, headache, yep. brain fog, dizziness. Um, you know, and, and I think, first of all, anybody who, you know, is suspected to have a head injury or experiences any of these uh, symptoms after any type of head injury, car accident, anything like that. I mean, they should consult a sports medicine physici physician and um, be evaluated to determine what's going on. I will say in doing that, make sure, especially as a parent, you recognize that most of the testing after a suspected head injury is going to come back normal, meaning mm -hmm. MRIs, CAT scans, CT scans. Um, we run those to make sure there's nothing terrible and catastrophic happening. And sometimes right. there is. And then without doing those tests, you're not going to look, you're not going to see them. But, um, you know, usually those all show everything is fine. And then it's kind of like, all right, your brain is bruised, go rest and go, go take it easy. That was the old school philosophy is rest and, and sit in a dark room and don't be around anything uh, sensory wise. And, and now I think we're almost, we were at the other end of the spectrum. Now we're a little bit more in the middle. Um, you know, I think a lot of head injuries do resolve on their own in terms of the symptoms and then do improve with time. Um, and a larger percentage of, of older adolescents um, do return to like a pre-injury level, let's say before head injury and a lot of adults do, but for many, it can take a lot longer. Um, and I think there, there's an interesting study that came out uh, fairly recently that said, um, I think it was after a year after a concussion or a year after a, a concussion, a third of kids still have symptoms or headache or irritability that mm. can affect school performance. And very often you just, the child feels if it's a child who can't articulate or communicate how they're feeling or what's going on, it's just behaviors different, frustrations are different, um, and, and 
you know, the symptoms that happen from a concussion very often don't go away without active work or active learning to take place. And that can really complicate the recovery, getting back to previous level of functioning and can make it so, you know, life is very different and going to a mall, a grocery store with all the sensory input is just this overload or, um, you know, seeing a pattern on a shirt is dizzying or nauseating or you're mm-hmm. getting motion sick and things like that. And I think that's something that, um, is getting a lot more awareness now as we are all learning about head injuries and getting research coming out and having athletes who are now speaking up. But uh, our brains are the only brains we got. And, and I know this is your bread and butter and, and what you are the expert in, but we got to take care of our brains and be able to mm-hmm. uh, get to a place where we can prevent the, the avoidable head injuries that happen down the road, because we know with one head injury, we're more likely to have another and another unless we're able to uh, rehabilitate, especially the visual brain and get back to a place where we know where we're located in space and where other things are in relation to us. Would you say a lot of, you call them like the sports medicine physicians who Mm -hmm. kind of treat the concussion, do they seek out someone like you for vision therapy? I mean, is that the, the ones who know what they're doing, yeah. um, you know, they should, I, I think, is what you're saying. They should. Yeah, they, they yeah. should. Um, you know, I think a lot of PT has adopted vision work um, and mm-hmm. vestibular work to help with concussion recovery just because the need is so great. Um, and, and PT adopted this, which I think is fantastic. But a lot of times it does leave people kind of up a creek without a paddle where they're doing mm-hmm. some vision work where it's like eye jumps from one place to another or vestibular work, which is kind of that internal orientation system that lets us know which way is up and down and left and right. And with most head injuries, there's some some level of disconnect between vision and vestibular input where we're not able to um, integrate central and peripheral processing at the same time. And so PT does, does some work there. I, I think um, all the big, at least by us, all the hospitals that are really progressive and, and, you know, developing programs for head injury, they have a vestibular PT on staff, they have awesome. yeah. in-house stuff, but then, you know, at least for the ones in the area by me, I usually only get sent the ones who are just not getting better at the speed or rate that mm-hmm. they should. And, um, you know, it, it's crazy to think that almost any head injury, and when I say almost the vast majority, you can get back to previous level of functioning uh, with the right work and the right motivation. Can you, I, I'm not really trained in acute care medicine, but quickly for our listeners, what should someone do if they get a concussion? I mean, obviously you go to the ER, but like if it's minor or you know, are yeah. there any just basic tips? Like, should they take anti-inflammatories? Like what, what are some? So I think definitely, um, you know, don't go to sleep right away. You know, that's the type of thing that I think a lot of doctors are pretty consistent with mm-hmm. is, you know, when that happens, you know, tr- try and obviously remove yourself from play. That's a big issue if it's from sports, mm-hmm. but most head injuries are not from sports now. Um, you know, I think for the first couple of weeks, omega threes are hugely important. There's a neurologist mm-hmm. I work with who prescribes uh, for anyone who's had a head injury, whether it was a recent one or years ago, a loading dose of nine grams for the first wow. two weeks. And then six yeah. grams thereafter. I think that's a lot, but mm-hmm. you know that omega threes help facilitate healing, and our yep. brain is made out of you know those yep. substances. Yep. So, um, but I think you know increasing changing nutrition and increasing protein and in, increasing hydration and and electrolytes and there's lots of supplements that are important as well. Um, but I think definitely getting it you know getting it checked out. Anti-inflammatories can help mm-hmm. obviously remediate the symptoms and, and the headaches that are occurring, but kind of try and avoid environments with lots of bright light stimulation. Lights and, yeah. Yep. And noise and you know that heightened sense of arousal mm-hmm. is is what really just allows that autonomic nervous system to turn into a fight or flight response. And then you just sure. want to retreat and do nothing. Sure, sure. Um couple other questions. This is great. I'm thinking, where should I go next? You did mention COVID a few times, like when we kind of opened the episode talking about how, yeah, parents probably were letting their kids FaceTime to see grandparents or, you know, whatnot. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how else has COVID impacted our eyes? What'd you say? So two main areas. Um, the first we have seen, we stopped counting. It's It's been so high. Patients who've come in uh, with symptoms and and findings in the presentation completely consistent with a concussion or head injury, but who haven't had a head injury. 
And in doing a lot of research or a lot of digging in terms of the history, it, in many of these cases, it was either after getting COVID, after receiving a, a vaccine or a booster, and I don't think we should go down that route of talking about all that. Um, but if there's low level inflammation, and then there's some sort of event that allows for that inflammatory cascade mm -hmm. to, to then increase, um, you know, it can create these symptoms that are like a head injury. So the dizziness, the blurriness, mm -hmm. the headaches, the fatigue, all of that. Um, but I think more consistently across the board, and when I say across the board, like um, almost everybody I'm seeing, if we go back to what we talked about, about visual stress and stress from our environment, if we don't have the tools in place to meet the demands of the stress, we adapt or we avoid, we are not meant to be staring at screens all day. And especially mm -hmm. with virtual learning for kids who don't have this, the visual development and systems in place yep. or telework for adults, you know, we're staring at a screen for sometimes 10, 12, even longer hours of the day without even getting up or looking away. And um, I, I think there's, there's so much we can do to set up visual ergonomics, to take breaks, to be able to um, force our brain to disengage and to be, get outside and to balance the distance with the near demands. But I would say from COVID, uh, the uh, incidence of nearsightedness has dramatically increased. The amount of kids with uh, learn vision, visual developmental delays impacting learning and reading has definitely increased. Um, and the amount of headaches and eye strain from what I'm seeing has increased. One great solution for this is there are certain glasses that can be helpful for a lot of people. Um, everyone's kind of heard about blue blocking filters mm -hmm. and that's, that's helpful. Um, but I think blue blocking filters with the right performance lenses in them. So in many cases, mm -hmm. it's a low plus magnification that relaxes the focus or sometimes prism that helps disengage. So you don't have to converge your eyes as much. There's support systems in, in, the setup of a, of a lens or, or spectacle lens that can really help make it so that there's less visual stress and then your internal response to that is different. Um, from the blue light standpoint, blue light is, is not bad. Blue light is actually good for us in, in certain quantities and in certain scenarios, but blue light blocking glasses blocks a certain wavelength of, of light. And that's that high contrast, high energy, bright light from the screens that's artificial. Artificial light is different than natural light, but with that artificial light, a higher quality blue light blocking lens is going to block a larger wavelength, so a larger range, mm -hmm. so it's more protective versus the, you know, five dollar ones that you see on Amazon. For most people, doesn't really have too much of a protective benefit. Um, yeah, and I found out those have like ten percent, you know, blue light blocking ability it's not like they're blocking 100 percent. if you really want to block blue light you got to wear the nerdy you know amber like absolutely glasses those are the ones that block the blue light so if they're really fashionable like but you know ten dollar off amazon they're probably only slightly blocking but, the blue light but also for your to my understanding yeah i mean ask them when, when they go to their eye doctor that's almost always an add-on that you can get on glasses but ask about different um different tiers you know, I know my practice, we have three different tiers of blue light blocking filters, and almost never do we even allow somebody to get the lowest tier, which says just go get it online, it's cheaper and going to make more sense. But the higher tier, you're blocking a larger range. And just like you said, the ones that actually have tints in them because they're blocking that much light um, aren't always needed, but are life changing. Um, I have sure. many patients who that's, they wear those all day long because that's the only way you can get out I of can, bed. Yeah. Yep. I want to go to motion sickness next, because this is something I've struggled with. So how's vision related to car sickness? So in my opinion, this is one of the biggest kept secrets in eye care, or at least in, in, Lay the, it vision, on us. Yeah. in the vision <laughs> therapy world. So for most people who are motion sick, it's usually way worse when you're in the back seat. if you're mm -hmm. reading, if you're mm -hmm. on a tablet, if you're on a train and you're trying to read and everything's going sideways, um, motion sickness from, from a lot of perspectives is thought about inner ear and certain things like Meniere's disease and things sure. like that, which uh, that's not my wheelhouse. That's not amendable to this type of treatment and what I specialize in. But I would say that probably about 80 to 85% of motion sickness has a visual component that's treatable. So I don't want to get into the weeds with neurology, but to really simplify it, we have two different types of visual processing pathways in our brain that are wired together. One that responds to central focal visual input and one that responds to peripheral ambient visual input. 
And when those are providing the same feedback on where something is in space, what's in motion, what's not, um, they were then functioning in, in a healthy way and we're not experiencing motion sickness. What happens when we're in a car and in those scenarios, we're in the back seat or reading or, or, or on a tablet, we're overriding the focal input that's letting, telling our brain that we are static and we are not in motion. Yet the vestibular system and the peripheral processing system activates this, this receptors that allow us to know we're in motion. And our brain is in this disconnect where it's kind of almost like a seesaw going back and forth between using those two systems to, uh, to process information. And that push and pull or that tug of war makes it so that we don't know which way is up or down or left or right and where we are, which is why mm -hmm. when we're sitting in the front seat or when we're driving, yeah. We can override central focal processing oh, sure. and plan ahead and plan our body ahead for the turns that are coming, even unconsciously. Um, so I would say with it, it's rare to not have motion sickness improve with neurooptometric vision therapy, but in many cases completely eliminated. Um, sounds like a dream. Fact, yeah, it sounds amazing. Fact, yeah. It's not motion sickness, <laughs> other things like that. Sure. Um, can I give your listeners a, a procedure to do at home to help with motion sickness? Please, please. Yeah. Uh, for this will help some, it may help a ton. It's called the infinity walk. So if you can picture an infinity signs, kind of like, uh, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. number eight turned, mm -hmm. um, start off by putting like two stools in a room or two objects. And you're basically going to be walking in an infinities path around the stools with your eyes or physically you physically, physically walk okay 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 but trying to keep you put like a sticker on the wall or look at something on the wall so that as you're turning you're never looking away from the sticker or never looking away from the wall so you're walking in this infinity yep, pattern yep. but you're making all these body and neck and head rotations while yeah. never losing fixation and that creates an a wonderful cross cerebral cross brain connection that doing that enough with the right kind of building yeah, from, yeah. Can, can help a lot of people. And if you even Google infinity walk, you'll see a lot of different procedures out there uh, that, that build off of that. You can then add eye movements to it. You can add changes in position. You can move away the, the different tar the stools that you're walking around and you can visualize where they are. You can make the pattern larger. You can make it smaller in terms of the path you're on. You can change directions. You can turn on a metronome. And every time, every X amount of beats, you're changing direction there because then you're integrating multiple mm -hmm. sensory input. I mean, there's a lot that can be done to start broad and then fine tune that moving forward. So is that like what vision therapy is? Like these sort of exercises that kind of teach, I mean, is that part of the... So I would say yeah. yes, but, <laughs> but vision therapy is more like that on steroids. Um, yeah. Vision therapy relies a lot on lenses and prism and filters and um, take, for instance, a lot that, more than sure, but, but take, for instance, that infinity walk there. But instead of, as we're building that, maybe we have then a target on the wall where it's a picture of a clown and a hat and the clown is seen by the right eye and the hat seen by the left eye. And you're wearing red, green glasses or Polaroid filters that controls what each eye sees and how each eye filters so that when the eyes disengage or become unstable, you'll see the hat shift. And then maybe, um, you know, we'll use a lens or prism to artificially change where the hat's located, move it on top of the clown, and then teach the patient what it feels like, what it looks like, and the depth or the 3D awareness that occurs when the eyes are working together. And then we ask them to reproduce that setup, whether it's with movement or on an overhead or projected out a window, and then using lenses or prism to support what they can't do on their own, but then eventually substituting mm -hmm. their visual skills or abilities for what that was doing. So that the hats on top of the clown without the help of any other filter lenses or prism, because your eyes are pointing in the same place and your brain's turning on and responding to that information appropriately. Does that make um, sense a little? Yes. I mean, it's, it's somewhat over my head and I'm sure the listeners, but it sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it takes a smart person to, yeah. Figure that out. Vision therapy is arranging the conditions to raise to somebody's awareness what they're doing so they can learn how to self-correct and self-monitor and make bad habits no longer options. Love it. We could end the episode right there, but I have to ask one more question and we'll wrap up. Absolutely. <laughs> so I do want to ask about supplements to promote yes. the longevity of the eyes because you mentioned fish oil. Briefly, do you want to just mention a couple others if you have some top favorites? Yes. Um, well, first with, with, um, with fish, I think cold water fish which you sure. probably can speak to way better yep. than anybody else. Um, green leafy vegetables yep. 
are fantastic. Um, kale, collard greens, spinach, all of that. And, and the, the lutein and zeaxanthin that's in there is great for the macula, which is the sweet spot of your eye for the line of sight. Um, eggs are great. They have lutein, they have, um, you know, I, lots I think of any, choline, but yeah. lots of choline. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, um, vitamins A, C, and E and citrus fruits and fruits with it and dark, dark fruits with antioxidants, mm -hmm. great for preventing macular degeneration, cataracts. Um, and I know you're big on nutrition as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, of information coming out now about how macular de degeneration can almost be viewed as, as like type three diabetes, mm. um, and is in response to inflammation and, and insulin resistance. Um, we have a lot of patients who we put on a, a strict, um, elimination diet or on a keto diet where they can shift how their brain and body is functioning as uh, what it's using as a fuel source, going away from sugar, going into ketones. Mm -hmm, and especially mm -hmm. if there's inflammation already or a concussion, that speeds up the recovery dramatically. Um, coenzyme Q is great. Um, carrots, broccoli. <laughs> this is how should we, we should be eating for our hormones as well, listeners. Yeah, not just for our eyes, right? <laughs> just in general, this is how we should be eating. So. Well, and you probably see with a lot of a lot of your clients and patients that when hormones are all out of whack, some of the symptoms are visual. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. The, the yep. Brain fog comes from a lot of different areas, but um hormonally that should be the first thing we're addressing and back to concussion i know progesterone is neuroprotective testosterone is great for blood flow optimizing hormones can even help with recovery from injury and concussion and whatnot too so a little plug-in for hormones there well this has been amazing so tell us where listeners can find you so you do you work with clients virtually if someone's listening and they they want to work with you do you work virtually or do you have any sort of online programs kind of tell us about your business Great question. So um, my practice is in, is in Maryland outside DC, but as of this year, um, I've set up a, a way to work with people virtually. It's drbriceapplebaum.com. Um, there's a lot of different things that we, ways to work with me or ways to offer help. Uh, we have a couple different programs. Uh, we have one called Screen Fit, which is absolutely awesome and fantastic. And it's it's a wellness program designed to help people engage with screens for longer by doing vision exercises uh, daily, almost like going to the gym for your eyes so that screens are less terrible and that you can develop the systems to support those demands, even though we should be avoiding screen screens as much as we can. Uh, so screenfit.com is where you can find that. And I uh, would love to offer a, a discount to all of your uh, listeners here. Um, we'll, we'll put the, the discount code if you can put it in the show notes, maybe, but we yeah. can give, give a discount to, to, to join that. Um, and then I'm on Instagram, Dr. Bryce Applebaum, um, and practice website, applebaumvision.com. But, uh, we all, I, I hope that everyone learned a ton and, and learned that they can, we all know better so we can do better. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should be challenging doctors and people where things don't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately, it's a problem with the eye care world more than anything else, but uh, vision matters way more than eyesight. Think of those as different things. Love it. Okay. I would ask your top longevity tip, but I feel like that last sentence was great. Uh, <laughs> longevity tip. What's your top longevity tip? Yeah. So everyone's heard of 2020 eyesight. Everyone should be doing a 2020 20 rule, which means with screen time, with near work, with anything up close, Never more than 20 minutes without taking a break for 20 seconds and look at something 20 feet away. Hmm. Uh, speaking, of long, yeah. speaking of longevity, uh, most people around their 40th birthday, all of a sudden arms aren't long enough. You have to hold things farther away. We can train our bodies. We can train our muscles. But for some reason, people think we can't train our eye muscles and we can't train our eyes. You can prolong the need for reading glasses. You can decrease the power that's needed for reading glasses by exercising the visual system and by developing better control over focus stamina and focus flexibility. And there are lots of exercises that can be done at home as almost like a daily ritual, kind of like meditation or going to the gym. I have a lot of my patients, it's here's the top two, top three, top five things I want you to do every day. And it can definitely slow down the anatomical changes that occur. Uh, and in many cases, dramatically. Love it. Mic drop. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for coming on the show today and sharing so much. I know I and the listeners didn't know about their vision and how, how it's different from eyesight, right? So I know this will be helpful to many. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Appreciate having, having me on here. And thank you so much for, for offering this to your listeners. <laughs>